So I want to welcome everybody today. Um, my name is Sherry Lipman. I am the director of the Implementation Science and Health Systems Corps at UCSF's Center for AIDS Prevention Studies, along with my co-director, Dr. Wayne Stewart. We have an amazing panel of speakers planned today who will be presenting frameworks for adapting interventions, um, provide insights into how understanding context informs adaptation, and also discuss intervention adaptation approaches and case studies with different populations and settings. Before I introduce the first panel, I just want to give everyone a few notes on how this is going to work today. So this is going to be a jam-packed three-hour workshop, and we're planning on running it straight through so we can ensure that we can fit everything in and have ample time for questions and discussions. So we're going to ask that everyone keeps their microphones on mute unless we call on you to speak. Um, if you need to step away for a quick break, you can do that at any time, of course. And we're going to ask folks to keep their video off um, unless you're one of the speakers on the panel. You can add questions into the chat at any time. We'll be monitoring the chat and then include questions during the panel discussion. Um, this meeting is being recorded, so um, you might see the pop up as soon as you get on the screen and just accept that, please. And that way you can access the content at a later time. Um, we're also going to send out a survey at the end and your feedback really helps us shape the content that we offer. So we really hope that you can take a minute to complete that when it arrives. So I'm going to ask everyone to put on their seatbelts because this is going to be packed full of information. It's going to go very, very quickly. Um, Rochelle, you might want to start the recording. Is, unless it, you already did, right? We're good. Okay, sorry. So um, our first speaker today is Dr. Gina Wingood. Um, she is a professor of public health promotion. She directs a number of programs and centers at Columbia University, bringing decades of expertise designing, evaluating, and disseminating interventions that reduce health disparities in HIV, particularly among African-American women. Her interventions and her adaptation framework, Adapt It, have been widely used all over the US and globally. After Dr. Wingood, we'll have Dr. Maria Fernandez. She's gonna present on adapting evidence-based interventions using I Am Adapt. Dr. Fernandez is a professor of health promotion and behavioral sciences at the University of Texas Health Science Center and director of the Center for Health Promotion and Prevention Research. She has extensive experience developing and evaluating health promotion interventions and conducts research to improve dissemination and implementation of effective programs with an emphasis on cancer prevention and control in underserved populations. Our final speaker in panel one is Laura Dam Schroeder. She is a distinguished investigator with the Veterans Affairs Ann Arbor Center for Clinical Management Research. She led the development of the CIFR and CIFR 2.0 frameworks, probably the most widely cited frameworks in implementation science. Her research focuses on applying theory and developing pragmatic approaches for understanding context and tailoring strategies for implementation success. So with that, I am going to ask everyone to put their little view into speaker mode, top right of your screen, and give Gina your full attention. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Really, thank you for the whole, um, whole UCSF team for hosting this implementation science workshop. As was mentioned, I'll be talking about the adaptive framework. As part of adaptive, we're gonna talk a little bit more about adapting evidence-based HIV interventions. So what do I mean when I say defining adaptation? Adaptation is really sort of making changes or modifications to an EBI, really to enhance fit for a population. This may include intervention additions, deletions, and our substitutions. Adaptation is really a balance between fit and fidelity. Modifying intervention to enhance fit to make the EBI compatible with the population, as well as their health goals, but also maintaining fidelity to the core components of the EBI. There are pros and cons to adaptation. Pros include enhancing fit for the population, ownership, feasibility, and involvement of team members. Cons include your modifying an intervention with known efficacy to something with potential unknown efficacy. And also it can be costly and timely. Excuse me, I just wanna make sure, did you have slides that we're supposed to, we're not seeing slides right now. You don't see the slides? No, we just well, see Well, that's you. not good. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, let's, I'm not sure why you're not seeing the slides. Um, do you see them now? 
No, maybe you can. Oh, that's odd. Okay, let's go back a little bit. Ooh, this worked two seconds ago. I know. That's crazy. Um, Not to worry. Okay, so let's go to sh um, share screen. Let me do that one more time. Can you see them now? Yes, we can. Oh. We're not in presenter mode yet, though, so. Okay, let's see here. Oh, presenter mode, right? There it goes. Is that better? Perfect, perfect. Sorry, not sure what happened there. <laughs> okay, so I was asked to talk a little bit more about the history of Adaptive. Um, in 95, I had developed an evidence-based HIV prevention program on ASSISTA. The goal of SISTA was to enhance safer sex among African-American women. I partnered with an African-American CBO. This intervention had five sessions that talked about ethnic and gender pride, communication, continuity skills that was delivered by an African-American female health educator. This intervention was published in JAMA. It was the first HIV prevention program to enhance consistent condom use for African-American women. Given its efficacy, and at that time there weren't any other interventions available, and so it was widely disseminated across um, the U.S. by CDC. So I developed not just the intervention, but I also developed a dissemination package. It was um, widely developed just in this two-year period, 2008 to 2010. Looking at Texas, for example, over 300 people were trained in, in the sister intervention. And looking at Texas again, just for a two-year period, over 100 agencies were trained in SISTA. The, the dissemination package included many things, fact sheets, logic models, the adaptive protocol. There were many, there's been many global adaptations of SISTA for Japanese women, South African women, Spain, the Caribbean. So what happened, what really prompted my development of this model is when CDC was disseminating SISTA, I would ask questions like, well, how do you know they're implementing the intervention with fidelity? And I said, if fidelity is not an issue, how are they modifying the intervention? CDC would say, you know, there's many CBOs who are modifying the intervention. I said, well, that might be fine, but do you know what they're doing? Do you know what they're not doing? Are they maintaining core elements? I said, you know, we don't know any of that stuff. I said, well, that's interesting. And so I said, maybe what I can do is just develop a model to facilitate the adaptation of SISTA. And that's how ADAPTED came about. ADAPTED is sort of a very popular used um, adaptation framework in the area of HIV prevention. Um, uh, article was published a couple of years ago citing ADAPTED is very popularly used for the area of HIV. So ADAPTED has eight steps. Let's go through those. The first step is assessment. During this step, we ask who's the new population that the EBI is being adapted for and what is their differential vulnerability? The second step involves deciding, deciding what evidence-based intervention or interventions may be the best fit for your population. The third step is administration. So basically you're trying to understand what in the original EBI can be adapted. There's typically a red light, yellow light, green light approach to adaptations. Green light adaptations typically include minor adaptations that are designed to enhance reach, relevancy, as well as receptivity, maybe sort of changing ways to recruit or engage a population, changing the language of your intervention, or customizing the content and materials to actually enhance fit for your population. Yellow light adaptations might involve maybe slight modifications, but you have to really be really cautious. Right, maybe it's altering the order of program activities, adding activity to address risk factors or cultural contextual factors, applying an epi to a different population, changing the setting or the delivery format. Red light adaptations really should not be actually conducted. They sort of, you know, if you're changing or if you want to change the underlying theory or mechanisms of change or any of the epi goals, these are strongly sort of advised against in this adaptation program. The fourth step is called production. Producing an adapted EBI requires a team. And I call this the adaptation team. 
This team includes representatives from the new population, so your new EBI participants. It also includes what I call collaborators or people who work with the participants, could be CAP members. This adaptation team, their role is to really decide what's adapted, how it's adapted, and why is it being adapted to enhance reach and receptivity. There's usually about 10 members to this adaptation team. Theater testing is a participatory measure, method used with this adaptation framework. During a theater test, a health educator actually implements green light and yellow light activities from the original EBI with the adaptation team. Subsequently, there's a debriefing with the team on what content is adapted and how it's adapted. The fifth step involves topic experts. Topic experts are simply a specialized type of collaborator. They may involve people like us, academics. They may be involved pastors or health department officials, or they're typically content experts. And these topic experts are also part of the adaptation team. Adaptation is actually an iterative process. It's not so like, you know, you do a couple things and it's done. It's really an iterative process. Step seven involves training. Train the recruiters and the health educators to implement the adapted intervention. And of course, pilot testing and testing the adapted intervention. And people always ask, does it have to be an RCT and it does not have to be a randomized control trial in which you actually test the adapted intervention. I'm gonna present two case studies. My first case study is adapting system for Latinas. This was called Amigas. So the original system was conducted in a um, CBO, African American CBO. Amigas was adapted for health department clinics on Miami Dade, Florida. Of course, we adapted recruiters for Latina recruiters. We had Latina health educators. We adapted the recruitment materials to be appropriate for our population. We also adapted intervention content. During the very first session of SISTA, we would ask certain questions such as, what do you enjoy about being an African-American woman? How are African-American women negatively depicted in the media? And what are some African-American female role models? In Amigas, we just adapted the content. What do you enjoy about being Latina? How are Latinas negatively depicted in the media? And who are some Latina role models? Just an illustration of adapted material depicting Latina women negatively portrayed in the media. And of course, adapted material depicting positive images and attributes of Latina women. This is my adaptation team. Topic experts, including using Latinas from the community. After integration, training of the, of the Latina health educators and pilot testing, I actually used RCT. This article was published in the American Journal of Public Health, and it was one of the first interventions for Latina women to reduce HIV risk. I would like to present one other case study. This is adapting CISA for faith-based settings. So remember the original CISA was actually conducted in an African-American CBO. So now I'm adapting CISA for predominantly black churches. I mentioned not simply in black churches, but in Atlanta, I actually used mega churches. By definition, a mega church actually has over 2000 people. In public health, I love working with lots of people. The churches that I typically worked with had 10,000 people. Mega churches just aren't in Atlanta, they're all over the US. This is just an example of one of the churches that I worked with, some of the sculptures, they're amazing. So I also adapted the reach to reach church leaders as well as their members. I reached out to female leaders in the church, specifically the directors of the women's ministry. I just didn't use brochures, I adapted the recruitment materials, I conducted a, a recruitment website. I used health educators from the church health ministry. Topic experts included pastors on the adaptation team as well. And of course, here's my adaptation team. So the original Abby, again, I talked about sort of the joys and challenges of being an African-American woman. 
The adapted content talked about the values of being an African-American Christian woman, the role that Christianity played in the African-American community. In addition to talking about HIV risk, I also addressed issues of absence. So here I adapted to the delivery as well. I had pastors discussing HIV testing at the pulpit. I adapted my partners and my collaborators to represent sort of more socio-historical leaders. I worked with the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. It's the largest and really the longest um, organization serving African-American populations. I worked with Tyler Perry Studios, Alicia Keys. And of course, I worked with historical churches such as Ebenezer Baptist Church, where Martin Luther King served as pastor, and CBOs such as Baum and Gilead. I adapted my social justice messages to discuss more transformational leaders for social justice. Here's just a couple of social transformational leaders. I adapted the commitment to address HIV prevention. Let me just show you a couple of the videos that I use to adapt content to really depict sort of historical and political leaders talking about HIV prevention. So one of the things that we're here in front of this van to do today is my wife and I are going to get tested for HIV AIDS. Because if you know your status, then you can prevent illness. You can prevent passing it to your children and to your families. And we can make everybody have healthier, happier lives. So I just want everybody to remember that if a U.S. Senator from the United States can get tested and his wife can get tested, and everybody in this crowd can get tested. Let's take 10 minutes to discuss your responses to the following questions. Could you take an HIV test today? Could you ask people in your church to get an HIV test? Can you talk about HIV testing in your sermons? And can you ask church leaders like yourself to take an HIV test and talk about HIV in their sermons? In this style of transformational leadership, we hope that you incorporate these steps in your church ministry and encourage others to do the same. I also want to frame the context around how I'm presenting HIV. And this is how I did it. There are currently 21,000 black churches in the U.S. 53% of the black community says they attend church weekly. This means the black church has the ability to harness the power of 20 million parishioners to help deliver an AIDS-free generation. Now is our opportunity. We were called to serve. We have the power to help stop the HIV epidemic in our community. We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we, the NAACP, have our armor on. Will you join the fight? Act now and visit www.theblackchurchandhiv.org. Do you know what I want? I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. So what I'm doing, I'm framing HIV differently. I'm not framing HIV as a health condition as such. I'm really framing HIV as a social justice imperative. Again, after integration, training recruiters and health educators to implement this adapted intervention and pilot testing the intervention that was also published in the American Journal of Public Health. Thank you. Amazing, thank you, Dr. Wingood. Thanks. Um, we are going to jump. That was super powerful. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of questions um, in the audience, but we're going to jump right into the next um, speaker. We'll have uh, Maria Fernandez start her presentation. There you are. <laughs> 
everyone, can you see the slides? We can. Great, thank you. Um, okay, well, that was very powerful. Thank you, Gina. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you today about um, I Am Adapt. And um, so what I'll cover, and I'm gonna do it really quickly, but we're gonna have some time to, to talk afterwards, is I'll talk just a little bit about what some of the persistent challenges and adaptation are, um, a little bit about adaptation frameworks more generally, and then I'm just gonna jump into using intervention mapping for adaptation, which is what we call I am adapt. And I'm gonna describe it to you using an online tool that's available to apply I am adapt called I am adapt online. So just so we're all on the same page, adaptation is a planned or purposeful changes to the design and delivery of an intervention. And it can include deletions, additions, substitutions. There's some really nice articles that have shown um, ways to, to document the types of adaptation that happen. And we know that programs or interventions need to be adapted to fit contexts of new target populations, delivery settings, locations, organizations, et cetera. What can be adapted? Well, people have adapted things like clinical practice guidelines or tools, things such as the surgical safety checklist, policies, general approaches can be adapted, approaches such as those that are recommended by the community guide, the US Preventive Services Task Force Guide, that recommend things that are general approaches like mass media, one-on-one -on -one education, provider reminders to make changes in health. Um, and policies can be adapted. Packaged programs or interventions that include specific instructions and materials are, can also be adapted and implementation strategies can be adapted. Although I am adapt can, and the principles and the process of I am adapt can be used for multiple different types of innovations or interventions. The focus really is on these last two, packaged programs and implementation strategies. So first, why do we adapt? Well, interventions that are perceived as more relevant and applicable are more likely to be used and sustained over time those versus those that have poor fit. And it's more efficient and effective to find an intervention that's been used and has been shown to work rather than to start developing an intervention from scratch. It can lead to improved engagement if an intervention has been adapted appropriately, acceptability, effectiveness, and outcomes. And I think we saw some, some compelling examples that Gina just showed. I like this, this quote by Charles Darwin that says, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that's most adaptable to change. And if we think about that applied to interventions, those interventions that are actually adaptable, that, that where it's not only their internal validity, but their external validity um, are probably the ones that are gonna maintain over time. And I, I think some of the uh, examples that Gina was showing have shown um, that the good interventions that are adaptable can uh, be maintained over time. What are some of the adaptation challenges that remain? So one is just finding evidence-based approaches and interventions. Another is assessing the strength of the evidence, supporting that EBI. We know that there are evidence-based interventions along the evidence continuum. Some of them are considered promising practices. Others are, have many studies that have shown their effectiveness. How do we assess EBI fit? with the population and setting? And how do we adapt EBIs to that population and setting? And this question is a big one. It includes understanding the EBI, its components and its logic with whatever materials we have available to look at or whatever articles there are published about that evidence-based intervention. Another challenge is how do we best compare it to what's needed? And how do we identify and maintain core elements. We know and we've heard many times that there are essential elements to interventions that made them effective in the first place. And when we're adapting, we want to maintain those while still making changes so that they fit the new context and population. 
And how do we assess organizational capacity to implement evidence-based interventions when the new um, adopting and implementing organization may be quite different from the one in which that evidence-based intervention was first tested in? And how do we adapt or develop, if they don't exist, implementation strategies to enable the effective use of this adapted intervention? So these are challenges that um, I think, despite that we've had great examples and some frameworks to guide our path, continue to be challenges. So I, I mentioned um, the core elements, and there has long been this debate about, well, what's more important, fidelity and fit? And the, the argument is that if you can maintain the core elements, then you can have both. But what are the core elements? In this example, was it the ingredients? Was it the protocol or recipe? Is it the context? Was it too warm here in Houston? And that's why they turned out like that. Um, and does it matter? Uh, are the, oh, those cupcakes, even though they're a little bit uglier, are they, do they taste just as good? And do people care? Right? These are questions I think that can be extrapolated as we think about adaptation and issues related to core elements. So some of the considerations um, that I just mentioned related to core elements include this question about what are they? And, and while I think that there's some idea that they could include things like certain pieces of content, certain delivery strategies, I would submit that it's the methods and mechanisms of change. And we've heard different, different terms, um, form and function of interventions, where people would say, well, the function is what's important. And that's also considered the mechanism of change is what's important. And it can take different forms. And so you're sort of safe. And it's at some of those green light and, and um, perhaps yellow light adaptations that Dr. Wingo was talking about that, um, that can change, but the core functions need to stay the same. So when we talk about making these adaptations and planned adaptation is one of the ways that we can do a better job of making those changes to improve fit while maintaining those core functions or core elements. And planned adaptation can be defined as a careful consideration of what should be adapted and using a deliberate process for doing so. And this can be done prospectively. And I think most of the time when people talk about planned adaptation, they are thinking about prospectively before implementation has begun. But it can also happen in real time. And certainly many of the adaptation frameworks that are out there now are useful for coding what adaptations have happened spontaneously. I think that planned adaptation can happen in real time, as long as the, the process and the logic is thought through. It has to be done quickly, but I think that there's possibility for planning even in real time. So I'm gonna say just a, a couple of things about adaptation frameworks in general before I jump into I am Adapt. Adaptation frameworks provide a pathway for getting us to that adaptation, to that adapted EDI. And they generally um, follow this route of assessing your community, establishing the goals and objectives, finding an evidence-based intervention and selecting the best one, and then adapting it by somehow comparing it to what we know the needs are in the community. And then of course, very important, implementing and evaluating it. So a few years ago, um, uh, led by uh, Dr. Thomas Scoffrey from Emory University and, um, and our, a team at UT Health and Emory, we conducted the scoping study of adaptation frameworks. And we found 13 frameworks, including three from gray literature and nine from published literature. And um, they, they fought, had a number of different um, uh, steps and here I've, I've highlighted I am ADAPT and you can see that ADAPTED is also here. And the, these were steps that are explicitly cited in these frameworks. When we looked at I am ADAPT within this and compared to others, we see that there is a gap here in consulting experts and consulting stakeholders. 
But in I Am Adapt, we consider these two steps as foundational principles that happen throughout all of the steps. And I think that that's also the case in some of these other adaptation frameworks where they may not explicitly state a particular step in the process of adaptation, but certainly consider um, some of those elements as weaving throughout those steps. One of the, the pieces of good news that was found uh, when we looked across these adaptation frameworks is that there were a lot of, of common steps. They're pretty similar. Um, in 11 of those frameworks, the key adaptation steps included um, assess, you know, community, assess community, understand, consult, adapt, implement, et cetera. And eight of the steps were recommended by more than five of the frameworks. Now, the bad news is even though there was consistency and there were general recommendations about these, it's not that easy. You can have some guidance about doing these things, but actually when you're getting into the, the, the details of how you do it, it gets a little bit more complicated. So enter I am ADAPT. I am ADAPT is a systematic approach for program adaptation, and it's it is derived from intervention mapping. Intervention mapping is a, a systematic process of using theory and evidence and new data for planning um, health promotion programs, multi-level health promotion programs. And intervention mapping can be used to advance dissemination and implementation um, in, in a number of ways. And one of those relevant here is in adapting evidence-based interventions. So, so I am ADAPT has um, five main steps, assessing the needs and assets and developing a logic model of change. So this part is being really explicit about the needs and resources, what actually needs to change, um, not only in individual behavior, but in environmental conditions, assessing organizational capacity, then discovering available evidence-based interventions, assessing the fit, and planning adaptations. And in this step, importantly, there is a, a part where you're describing that evidence-based intervention. And what we find is that even when you're using resources such as evidence-based cancer control programs, previously known as RTIPS, um, and other resources that describe evidence-based interventions, there's still sometimes questions that remain, like what is the logic of this intervention? How was it intended to work? What did they think was gonna influence what? And we think that this is really important in understanding those mechanisms, which are essentially these core elements of, um, of what makes an intervention work and things that we should pay really close attention to when we're embarking on any, um, on any adaptation effort. The next step is to actually put it into practice, and that also means planning the implementation. And this could include adaptation to existing implementation strategies. And then, of course, testing the adapted intervention and the implementation strategies. So those are essentially the steps of I am ADAPT. And, um, and what we've done is developed a, a tool. This was a, a grant that was funded from the National Cancer Institute to, to Dr. Uh, Patricia Dolan Mullen and myself as, as multiple PIs. Um, and it was to develop an online tool that would help people use I Am Adapt as they were finding um, and adapting evidence-based interventions. So I Am Adapt Online um, talks, I mean, shows the um, planners how to do this, but actually walks them through the process. So it's not a training, it's an actually like an expert system that helps planners document their needs of the, of the new community and setting, the expected um, change, helps them create a logic model, helps them search for evidence-based uh, approaches or interventions and determine potential fit, characterize those so they understand them clearly, and then base the changes for different components on a comparison between that, what that evidence-based intervention is and has and what's needed in the community and setting. So in um, I Am Adapt online, you could actually start, even though it goes through these five steps, you can actually start in different places because we know that some people already have 
an evidence-based intervention that they've identified. They don't necessarily need to find one, but um, they still have to kind of do step one because they still need to think about what does their community need. And so um, it, the process takes you through these five steps to help plan that adaptation. I'm just gonna really quickly take you through a few of these. So step one, analyzing needs and setting goals is where you describe the problem and needs of your population, describe the personal and environmental conditions that are influencing change um, and create this logic model of change. In I Am Adapt Online, it actually walks you through um, using sort of a, um, a, a, a tutorial approach. You know, we like to, to use the comparison of those tax programs, right? Like tax cut, where it's ask, asking you specific questions. And then in the background, it's sort of filling out this logic model for you. Um, step one helps identify the behaviors, the determinants, the outcomes. It also helps you identify those methods that are likely to influence those determinants of behavior and of environmental conditions. That, that can then help you um, select those evidence-based interventions that might best fit with your population and setting. In step two, you're discovering available interventions and, um, and you're looking at different websites and finding evidence-based interventions and strategies, reviewing them for basic fit before you launch into a more detailed process of adapting it. Um, so, I'm gonna just skip this. Um, in, in, in this step, it also allows you to kind of compare different evidence-based interventions and see which ones would have a better fit. In step three, we're doing two things. We're comparing our logic model of change that we developed in step one with the logic model of the evidence-based intervention, which we're creating at the, at the beginning of step three. So an important part of this step, and this is actually, actually a tool that we've kind of pulled out of I Am Adapt and, and created a separate tool called EBI mapping, evidence-based intervention mapping. And this process is to understand that evidence-based intervention. One of the reasons that we've also created it as a separate tool is that we know that sometimes people wanna understand evidence-based interventions to be able to implement them and not necessarily because they have to adopt them. I'm gonna go a little bit more quickly here, but, and just highlight a couple things. Um, one of the things that, that happens in this EBI mapping process is that you can actually look at what some of the common methods are for the different determinants that they were trying to change in that evidence-based intervention. And so even if they weren't explicit about that evidence-based intervention and the mechanisms of change, you can sort of deduce what they are by going through this process. And then in step three, we compare the logic model of change that you developed in one with the logic model of the evidence-based intervention. And you can make decisions about, um, and this is pretty cool because you can actually drop them into these different boxes and say, well, I think I need to add in this case, I need to add something, I need to modify something, or I need to delete something. Um, step four is actually putting this into practice. So now we have a long list of, of, of things, adaptations that need to be made and step four puts it into practice. And then in step five, we're, we're testing our progress, right? And part of step four is also planning those implementation strategy changes that are needed. So we've applied this, uh, I'm Adapt, to a couple of different projects, including this one, which was Cultivando la Salud, Cultivating Health, a breast and cervical cancer screening program that we adapted in Puerto Rico and also in Houston. And some really interesting um, experiences and, and learning about what we thought might have been um, core elements, but then we realized maybe they weren't core elements because they changed and, and it actually worked better. So happy to talk more about that in, in our discussion. Um, these were adapted both in Puerto Rico and, and also in Texas, and different decisions were made through that process by making those comparisons that I talked about in terms of differences in content, differences 
and or, or adaptations in delivering. Again, we can talk more about these in the discussion. Another example of where we applied I am adapt, and I, I have a citation here from um, um, Serena Rodriguez, is where we adapted a HPV vaccination intervention that was originally developed just for girls um, to also include boys. So remaining work that needs to be done is better incorporating considerations of resources, community engagement, participation of interested parties in this process, making the process simpler and making the tools simpler to use, improving usability, um, and maybe in the future, creating a learning community and adaptation repository or adaptome, as some people call it, um, where we can see some examples. Um, and um, I'll stop there and just special thanks to our, our team and, um, in, and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks everyone. I muted. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, so much information to digest. We are going to move on um, to Dr. Dam Schroeder. So here we're going to uh, introduce a complementary um, implementation framework that can be paired with um, adaptation models. And I will hand it off to you, Laura. Okay, have to find all my control buttons. I think I'm showing my slide. Um, you are? Uh, yeah, good. Yeah, so um, I'm going to change the, the uh, pace or the, the direction, I guess, a little bit by really honing in on context. And what I heard from both Gina and Maria is that assessment um, as a first step or as a very early step is very important. Um, so I'm going to talk about the consolidated framework for implementation research as a framework within implementation science that helps guide a systematic assessment of um, context. And um, okay, so we'll go from there. So first of all, I just want to, and, and Gina, I think both speakers mentioned this, I know Gina did in the very beginning, and that is that there is this balancing between adaptation and fidelity. And I really like this article by Von Thiele Schwartz and colleagues that talks about a value equation. And it really places and kind of works backward from the left side. And they propose that there are three complementary propositions for reconciling fidelity and adaptation. Um, and this equation, and they basically um, propose this equation that they call the value equation. And that what they um, state is that the uh, configuration, the, the optimal value of the uh, configuration of an intervention is a product of the intervention itself, including adaptations, the nature of the context in which the intervention is being implemented, and how well the Im implementation strategies optimize both the intervention and the context. And I think that you know both speakers so far have talked about the importance of fit, which is really what we're looking for. And one of the things that I appreciate about this value proposition is that the, the possibilities of adaptation are not just for the innovation, but also for context. Um, so just kind of making those balancing decisions between, you know, where do we adopt, adopt, adapt context to fit the innovation or and adapt the innovation to fit context. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the consolidated framework for implementation research. And I first want to um, really by, by starting this conversation with value, it really is kind of situating us in outcomes. And um, I think that both speakers really emphasize the importance of understanding the goals and the needs and what the um, basically the, the change model is or the change theory for the implementation. And that really is all about understanding um, innovation outcomes on the right but in order to achieve optimal innovation outcomes, we of course need to have optimal implementation outcomes as well. And when we talk about innovation outcomes in particular, it's important to understand or to 
um, incorporate uh, or, or really to understand the values and the needs of three key constituencies. And really this includes, these are just kind of broad categories, but there are key decision makers who may care most about efficiency and return on investment. They're the deliverers themselves, the people who are involved with ensuring optimal delivery and use of the intervention or the innovation. Um, they of course care about clinical outcomes for their patients, but then they also really care about work balance outcomes, for example, and especially when we're working with people that um, really have little capacity and time and um, high prevalence of burnout, paying attention to ways that we can choose interventions and implementation strategies to help make life better for the deliverers themselves. <clears throat> and then the third um, constituency, of course, are the innovation recipients. Um, and you know, including things like quality of life and, and convenience. Um, so when we talk about innovation outcomes, we often pay a lot of attention to determinants um, of the innovation or determinants that are related to um, the recipients, like their, their home, their family, their uh, community context. But we also need to really pay attention, and this is where I'm going to be focusing today, on specifically on implementation determinants. So when we're actually to the phase of implementing an innovation, what are those contextual barriers and facilitators that we need to address and pay attention to when we're selecting and launching implementation of an innovation? So I'm going to talk about the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. It was originally published in 2009, but we do have version 2.0 is under review and it's available online as well in Research Square. Um, and I'm going to talk today around the 2.0 version of the CIFR. I'm not going to really highlight changes um, per se, because that's really for another talk, but I just wanna focus on really using this framework as a way of assessing multiple levels of context. So the CIFR has five different domains. And the first domain, and the, the kind of the premise is that these domains all interact and they're dynamic and they have power to influence our implementation and um, ultimately our optimized outcomes. So we need to pay attention to the innovation itself. We need to define what the innovation is and Maria really emphasized this within the I am adapt tool um, that we need to understand the type of innovation, whether it's a, for example, if they have, if there is a technology component, if there are behavior change components, um, what each of the components are, and then to understand, and Gina really highlighted this in terms of the core versus the adaptable components. Um, um, and Maria in, in the step about theory that we really can't change the um, underlying change theory for an innovation, for example, those would be, that would be an example of the core components of an innovation. Um, in terms of constructs or potential barriers and facilitators that can affect implementation, that are related to characteristics or perceptions about the innovation itself. It can include the innovation source, the trustworthiness of the source, the evidence base, the relative advantage. I capitalize adaptability. I'm gonna talk about adapting later in another domain, but here we're talking about how adaptable is the innovation. Um, some are just, you know, kind of a black box, um, you know, in the way that they're packaged and really can't be adapted very well, while others are highly adaptable and we need to be careful about how far we take those um, the adaptation decisions. There's also the complexity design and cost of the innovation that can all affect um, implementation. So fundamentally using a determinate framework like the CIFR, we are taking an interpretive approach to context assessment. The stem of the question or kind of the root question that we're asking here is 
um, are to capture the, the perceptions of the degree to which, um, for example, the innovation evidence base is robust and support, supporting the effectiveness of the innovation. And evidence is not just scientific evidence, it's also their own experience, their colleagues' experiences, the feedback they may receive from their patients or their clients. So it's important to be holistic in when we're determining perceptions of evidence. And even though the scientific evidence can be very robust and strong, according to the US uh, TFPS, for example, um, that doesn't mean that clinicians or coaches or um, you know, people involved in delivering necessarily buy into that evidence. So it's really important to understand what their perceptions are. And this really is kind of at the foundation of using a framework like the CIFR. The second domain are the individuals themselves, the individuals involved. And both Maria and Gina um, gave some really great wide examples of the, um, the people involved. And, um, and Gina in her approach really emphasized the importance of including both the deliverers and the recipients of the innovation. And this is really the heart of, of course, healthcare and many of the, much of the other um, prevention work that we're engaged in um, or treatment work. We need to also consider um, people who will be or potentially involved with aiding or leading implementation efforts. And there are several roles related to implementation specifically. And then we also need to pay attention to those high level and mid level managers and decision makers or leaders. And then also opinion leaders who can have an outsized influence either positively or negatively, um, even though they're not necessarily in a formal leadership role. And so Gina, for example, talked about in her um, church uh, organizations involving pastors and ministry leaders and um, uh, church members as well. So really a wide role and really kind of reaching out to political leaders. And those would be great examples um, as opinion leaders. And then we need to pay careful attention to the characteristics of each of those roles. We need to understand their needs, their capabilities, the opportunity. Do they have enough dedicated time to actually in, um, engage in quality optimized implementation? Um, what is their motivation and commitment? Um, these are all important perceptions to understand um, before launching implementation. The next domain, the third domain is the inner setting. And so we recognize explicitly that the delivery of an innovation, the interaction of recipients with deliverers of the innovation are doing so within a clinical context, a school-based context, or it may be in a community, because we work in a lot of different contexts, Gina, you know, working in churches, and we need to understand the dynamics and the um, potential barriers and facilitators that emanate from the inner setting. So even though we may have highly committed and motivated individuals, there may be structural characteristics or cultural characteristics, relational connections, communications that can help facilitate or create barriers to um, implementation or to implementing any kind of change within their, within their setting. Um, then we also have, we need to understand and there are actually strategies to increase um, tension for change, um, perceptions of compatibility, how compatible is the innovation with my particular um, setting. And this is where um, adaptation clearly comes into play because if there is a perception of gaps in compatibility or gap in fit of the innovation with the context, it's important to understand where those points of incompatibility are. The next domain, the fourth domain, is the outer setting. So um, the delivery setting is usually residing within a larger socio-political um, setting that also influences um, the ability of uh, implementing change within a delivery setting. 
Um, one of the most common, probably, um, I'll call it kind of a kiss of death or certainly a very strong potential barrier, is that if there are policies um, in place that do not allow reimbursement for delivery of that innovation, that is definitely going to um, create a challenge or create a barrier for um, sustained delivery um, and something that we really need to pay attention to. So that's just one example that we often run across um, within the outer setting. So um, there are critical incidents in version two, we added critical incidents and these are things like the pandemic or um, you know, kind of mass uh, weather events. Um, there are local attitudes about, you know, the willingness of a community, for example, to um, provide services to, um, you know, within a, a community or a neighborhood. What are the local conditions, especially when we need to have those community ties um, or resources at the community level, um, for example, stable housing or transportation. What are the partnerships and connections? Are there resources out in the community that partnerships um, are lacking or where they can be built um, to help enhance implementation um, and so on. So these are all examples of kind of forces within the outer setting. So the last um, in the fifth domain is the implementation process domain. So once implementation is occurring, and um, we often look to this domain, especially retrospectively, when we're trying to understand what worked well and where. Um, often, like when we're, if we're doing a multiple setting implementation, we may find that the innovation, um, that the implementation was very successful in some settings, but not in others. And we wanna be able to understand that. Um, and so the definition of this domain is, again, the perceptions of the implementation process. What, are the, what is the degree to which activities and these specific activities were used to implement the innovation? And within the CFER, we have listed specific activities as determinants, as potential barriers and facilitators if they are not done completely as explanatory. Um, uh, determinants for uh, outcomes, implementation outcomes. So one is teaming. Um, these determinants are all common across many different models of implementation. So assessing needs, which we heard from both Gina and Maria is very important of, of deliverers and recipients really understanding what their needs are assessing context using a framework like the CIFR, and we put this in here explicitly to um, really highlight the importance of doing these, you know, there's two levels of assessment, and then planning in terms of setting goals and choosing strategies, and ideally that would be done in collaboration with um, recipients and deliverers. And then um, engaging and doing and then I put adapting in capitals. And so we've added that in version two to just explicitly um, list that as a best practice for implementation. And then taking the time and space to reflect and evaluate. And this is a cyclical kind of non-linear um, approach to implementation because again, this whole process needs to be adapted and uh, kind of reflect the needs and uh, the situation, basically a situation um, within this multi-layer context. So all in all, these are the five domains, the innovation on the left, um, really kind of merging in with and hopefully being successfully embedded within um, a delivery um, system or a context of delivery. So coming back to this value equation, again, there are opportunities to adapt context and to adapt innovation and understanding the potential barriers and facilitators that emanate from each of these five domains can then be used to help select implementation strategies and to help guide adaptations. 
So potential implementation strategies that would um, kind of gear toward adapting context might be to create new clinical teams. So to really reorganize and reconsider um, the way teams um, operate on a day-to-day -day basis to accommodate a new innovation. Um, or of course, adapting innovation, the innovation um, as part of that adaptation process, modeling and simulating change um, to help accommodate or to get people um, used to, to really kind of test and learn um, new ways of working. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so much to think about. And so I'm just going to get us started with um, a question for all of you. Um, Maria, there you are. Great. So um, I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about practical considerations, things like timing, like how long does the adaptation process take when you're actually on the ground? Um, and even where does one find EBIs? Like I remember um, within in the HIV world where I do most of my work, CDC used to have sort of a website you could go to and it had sort of everything listed out, but I'm not sure if the same exists, you know, in cancer control and other um, contexts. So I'm wondering if we could talk about, you know, where one finds them, how long it takes. And um, third part of the question, just to make this long, is sort of what needs to be in place. Because I know, you know, Maria, you noted that it's unclear how, or maybe you have a way to do it, but even assessing organizational capacity to implement one of these things. So like what needs to be, what structures have to be in place? And I know, Laura, you could speak to that as well. So maybe Gina, you can get started with um, that and then I'll let each of you have a chance to talk. Thanks, Sherry. So, um, you're right. So, where do you find these evidence-based interventions? You know, I think CDC used to have, or still has, a website, and it does have these evidence-based interventions on it at different levels. At the individual, organizational level, they have, you know, depending on what type of outcome you want to actually change, they have it sort of by outcome as well. Individual level outcomes. Do you want to focus on prevention? Do you want to work with um, individuals living with HIV? They have sort of all this sort of list of EBIs. And um, the tiers, and the tiers just means the rigor with which the, the intervention was evaluated. They have tier one, tier two, tier three interventions. But in addition to CDC, there's SAMHSA. And I think nowadays, I think CDC used to have a lot of EBIs, but nowadays there's many more lists and many more places. You know, SAMHSA has many. Um, I know the cancer control issue, they, they have many. Um, and then how long? It depends on what you want to adapt, you know? Um, and how you want to approach it, um, who you want to include in your team. It's, it's this, you know, so the more, the more you involve, the, sometimes the longer it takes, but it's not necessarily that equation. Maybe involving more people can take less time. It just depends what you'd like to do. Yeah, I, can, I can go next. Um, I, you know, I'm most familiar with uh, cancer control programs, and, and I mentioned um, the evidence-based cancer control programs that, that um, the National Cancer Institute has available, and it used to be called RTIPS, uh, Research Tested Intervention Programs, um, and, and that's, a, that's a really useful um, website and, and has a searchable database that you can look at that, and you know, when I talked about I Am Adapt, and when we first developed I Am Adapt, it was, it was funded by the NCI, and it was focused on on cancer, but then when we realized that there were a lot of other people that wanted to use it, we actually made a generic version. And so I realized that I, I gave you all the, the um, address for I'm Adapt just to let you know we're currently doing a, you could still get on it, but we're currently doing like a usability assessment, et, et cetera, and making sure that that generic version is um, up to speed. But, but the reason I bring it up is because as you get more generic, right, as you try to cover more types of EBIs, it becomes really difficult to say, okay, here are all of the resources, here are all of the compendia of EBIs. And then another challenge in that regard in finding them is um, they're, they're constantly being generated. People are, are, are developing or adapting and then evaluating and, and providing more evidence. And so I think that this is a real challenge. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do in our, uh, in, in our center at the Prevention Research Center is to, to at least 
be aware of what all of our faculty and, and colleagues are, are doing and the interventions that are becoming available. Um, but that pipeline from, from sort of research to practice and even what's available for adaptation, I, I think is, um, it continues to be a challenge. Yeah, um, I, I think that, that I will um, jump in and just say that I think that that is a really, it's a gap and it's a challenge, like, you know, Maria said, and um, that, you know, trying to create, a, you know, we've talked about like an adaptome repository, um, but that's for an innovation. And, you know, once you've already selected the innovation and maybe adaptations that people are making and the reasons and so forth. But we kind of need a similar repository for interventions. Um, and we just don't have that. I mean, I know, you know, CBC, CDC and, and SAMHSA, you know, and, and there's also a Canadian group that has, you know, just dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of evidence-based interve interventions. And, you know, there are taxonomies and um, there are real efforts that are being made to, um, kind of make these interventions available and accessible, but it is very difficult to think about, you know, maybe, maybe we need to kind of have a taxonomy for the interventions themselves that kind of follow the adaptation, you know, taxonomies, you know, the who, the, the why, the, the change theories underlying, um, et cetera, et cetera, you know, kind of walking through all of really the same concepts that Maria and Gina have both brought out with respect to adaptation. Um, so that's just a, that's a reflection. I mean, I think that understanding context is important for um, also choosing, you know, especially if you've got two or three innovations that you're considering, but rarely in my work anyway, um, do I come to the table with which one do you want to choose? Um, actually, I take that back. We have had, we have had projects where we've had a menu of interventions and, um, and, and kind of, you know, some high level guidance for how to choose them. But it's not easy to do because there's so many moving pieces. Sherry, can you repeat the first part of your question? Because I know I wanted to say yeah. something to it, but now I don't remember. Yeah, it was a long question. <laughs> um, one was sort of practical considerations. It was timing, sort of where oh, yeah. to find the EBIs, and then sort of what structures have to be in place in terms of like knowing that you could actually implement it, yeah. So I did want to make a comment about timing. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of our attention is really on um, more on kind of initial implementation. So we kind of assume, and I'm just gonna, you know, kind of exaggerate to make a point, but it, it's, it's like there's an assumption of first order change. You know, we need to get the people in place. We need to get the materials in place. We need to, you know, figure out the, like the enrollment, you know, process and, and, and get these things in place. And then we kind of move on and see if in six months we did a good job or not. Um, but in, in, you know, we, we, we do better than that, but, you know, a lot of our rhetoric is really kind of implying that that's our focus and, um, more and more, I'm really, you know, leaning toward the, the imperative and the necessity to continue optimization or adaptate, you know, which in, includes or requires adaptation over time. So I like imagine, you know, there's this bump of effort to do the initial pieces. And then there's this long tail of continued optimization. And the dynamic sustainability framework, which I can put in a link to it, really has that optimization and the need for teams and people to continue engaging and optimizing for sustained change. Great. So one comment I was going to make on the timing question is that, and you know, because people do ask, well, how long does it take to, to do I'm adapt? And my answer is always, well, it takes as long as you have. So, um, you know, and, and, and really the, you know, to do it the way that we teach it and the way that we want to do it, where you're, you're really engaged with a lot of different stakeholders and, and partners and you're using data and you're sort of making decisions about on what's happening in the community and 
and, and analyzing the evidence-based intervention to really, really understand it and see what can be changed and what can't. All of that, I mean, it, 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 to do it really, really well, yes, it can take some time. But usually what happens is it's just like any kind of research, just like any public health practice, right? It's a balance between what's optimal and what's feasible. And, and so I think with adaptation, it's, it's the same. Um, the, the, I didn't get to talk about it too much, but the project in, in Puerto Rico, they, they really liked this, this intervention that had um, like novelas, you know, sort of soap opera clip type style clips and that we had developed for a community of farm worker women in Texas. And, um, and we didn't have money to adapt it, right? It wasn't, it wasn't part of the project. And so we really, and, and when we looked at some of the factors that were influencing the behaviors, there weren't really huge differences. There were some differences in terms of the health system and things that were covered or not. But, um, but in the end, we, we had, a, it was a minimal, what we called a minimal adaptation. And, um, and we were lucky because Puerto Ricans um, really like watching Mexican soap operas. So that helped out. <laughs> but um, but the, the point is that you can't always, um, because of resources or time or whatever, do all of the adaptations that you would like to do. But it doesn't mean that an intervention is not going to be effective. In this case, we did find that it was, it was effective. Wayne, I know you're monitoring the chat and I see a bunch of questions in there. Do you want to pop on and let us know where to go first? Yeah, let's start here. So um, can I just kind of go down in order that I'm seeing them? But, uh, but Eleanor had a question for Laura specifically, although I suspect our other panelists could comment on this as well. And that's how do you determine what is core and should be maintained about an EBI and what's part of the adaptable periphery? Yeah, I know the others would have things to say. And Maria, you have a whole step um, in the I am adapt on this. I, I'm just recalling one of your slides. But, um, you know, ideally coming out of the clinical trial, you know, effectiveness work research, we would be handed information about which are the components that are kind of the irreducible core components that if you drop one, it's either going to fail or it's not this intervention anymore. It's something else um, versus the, the kind of the core, the, the peripheral pieces that can change. Um, I would say that in a lot of the work that, that we do, um, kind of rough, just to give you an example and a feel for the terminology um, of adaptable, you know, the use of the term adaptable periphery. I would think of those like, um, let's say that there's a, a weight loss, you know, or a, a weight management um, intervention, a behavior change, lifestyle behavior change program, and it's designed for dietitians to deliver, um, and it's a 12-week program, et cetera. But then there are eligibility requirements, and there are, you know, like one kind of referral, um, recruiting and enrollment process was used in the trials. I would say that, that often the adaptable peripheries are around how do you identify patients? How do you enroll patients? How do you, you know, kind of that whole process, there's very little said about that coming out of clinical trials. And so definitely those are processes that would need to be in some cases invented and in others adapted. Um, and then there may be differences with, um, instead of a dietitian, I'm gonna use a health psychologist to deliver um, or maybe in partnership with a dietitian. Um, is that a core you know, function like a red light you know, type of uh, do not you know, pass go here or is that a, a, um, a, an adaptable periphery so-called piece as well. And we just too often don't have enough information um, to help guide those decisions. Thank you. And I'll just, I'll note here that um, there's then another question here from Elena, which um, I think actually relates a little bit. It takes it in, in this really for the whole panel, not just specifically Laura for you, which is that, um, you know, as you're making decisions about, about adaptation, you can do things like have a focus group and have some people say, I think you should change this and have other people say no. And how do you make a 
how do you make the decision about about whether something does warrant the change or not warrant a change as as you're looking to adapt? Gina, Gina did you were you going to go? Uh, um, I, I love one. This is the beauty of Zoom. <laughs> So sometimes what we do is we use a model called theater testing. And you're right, sometimes when you ask participants, and when, I mean, it's hard. Some people say, yeah, that needs to be changed. And other people, you know, don't think, no, that's something to me need to change. So we involve other people, we call these collaborators, okay? These are often people who work with the participants. And sometimes they may have a different perspective to actually help the focus group participants actually see different perspectives of why something should or should not be changed. It's why we also use these topic experts. Um, so sometimes I think focus groups are great, but you might need to involve other people when making this decision. It's really, really hard actually. Um, and again, I think you have to say, you know, why are you making the decision? You know, it's to enhance reach, relevancy, receptivity, why are you actually making the decision? And can you, you know, can you afford to make this decision? Is it gonna cost you anything? There's a number of questions that you may wanna ask as well to help sort of come up with a response to that question. It's a good, it's an excellent question. Yeah, I was, uh, should I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I was just gonna add that, um, you know, I talked a little bit about trying to understand the mechanism of change of the original EBI. Right. If if you understand that this is what um, this was the method or the mechanism for changing this particular belief or this particular condition in the environment, the and that's what we might call the the function, right? The function of that of that component of the EBI, then the form might change, right? So so as long as you're still addressing, let's say, self-efficacy, or you're still addressing. Um, you know, a, a particular attitude or a particular condition that needs to be changed, the way you do it, how you operationalize that method or that mechanism, I think can, can vary. And, um, but, but having said that, I think that it is a, a, a challenge. And sometimes we think we know what a core element is, and then we're proven wrong. So uh, um, an example of this is that with the Cultivando la Salud project, which was based on door-to-door -door outreach with community health workers, talking to people in these, um, in these communities in, in South Texas along the border. Um, when we brought it to Houston and we did make some content changes, um, they, it, one of the things that we realized right away during implementation was that hmm, people aren't as willing to open the door for someone they don't know in urban Houston as compared to some of these communities, right? And I was really worried that this one-on-one -on -one exchange at someone's home was part of the core elements was um, in, in terms of delivery. But because of necessity, we had to change it. We had more group activities. We had telephone navigation. So we delivered it in a different way, still with lay health workers. Um, and we found it ended up being more successful, right? And so that just, to me, it sort of helped question the assumptions that sometimes we make about what those core elements are. Um, but if you think back to you know, my original statement about mechanisms, when you think back to, well, what is that? What is that that's working? When you have a lay health worker talking to somebody, modeling, you know, what happened to them, communicating to them about some of the main barriers that, that people have, in this case on screening, you can see that regardless of the delivery, that piece of it was still maintained. So still a ton to learn about this, this topic. Great. Yeah. Uh, one, oh, go ahead. Can I just add one thing? And that is, um, you know, speaking of, you know, question our assumptions, um, sometimes those disagreements are really important to um, put in the context of equity as well, considerations of equity and justice, because those disagreements may be coming out of, for example, the perceptions of historically underserved groups versus, you know, kind of the more traditional 
uh, mainstream groups that um, you know they may have very different needs and that the that the disagreements are coming out of their fundamental um, you know kind of need for different types of adaptations. So you may need to uh, um, you know adapt for different groups. You know it's not one size fits all. <laughs> Jose asks a very practical question that I think a lot of people would be interested in, which is, um, is there a place with any of your interventions, is there a place for some one-on-one -on -one training if somebody is really interested in taking up and using the framework that you've presented for adapting an intervention? Um, as far as a, uh, I am adapt goes, we're currently developing some training. So as part of our um, our CDC funded prevention research center, which is focused on implementation of, of cancer and chronic disease, um, we are developing some training on on helping people walk through using I am adapt online or I or also EBI mapping. So right now it, it's not there, but we're we're definitely working on it. Okay, so let's see here. Scrolling down, um, Audrey says, I have a question about adapting interventions that have been developed but are not EBIs. So they haven't gone through the efficacy or effectiveness trial. Maybe they've just been pilot tested or it's community developed intervention. What would you advise if an intervention like this seems most relevant as the thing to be adapted? Yeah, it's a common question. And um, you're right, CDC, they have these sort of tier one, tier two, tier three. And sometimes it's, you know, it's EBIs that aren't really, uh, they aren't even evidence-based interventions and you think it's appropriate. And it depends what the outcome, what do you want to actually use the intervention for? Um, you know, do you want to publish it? Do you want to just enhance community um, relevancy? What do you actually want to use that's adapted intervention for? What is the utility of it? And I think, you know, asking that question is helpful to say, you know, what type of intervention do you want to start with, out with in the beginning? Yeah, we actually encounter that quite a bit in our work um, within the VA system as well. And, you know, sometimes their interventions just don't exist to really meet these needs. And there's an imperative to, you know, put the best kind of a best practice in place that may not have the level of scientific evidence that we would want. Um, I highly recommend, and I'll put a, a, a link into an article if you're not familiar with it by Jeff Curran and colleagues that, um, walk through hybrid trials. So if you're able to, you know, do an evaluation along with that, with the implementation so that you're tracking both clinical or recipient outcomes and implementation outcomes simultaneously, um, so that then you can add to that gap in knowledge as you're, as you're working with this, you know, kind of sub, sub evidence-based practice. And I would just add that when we talk about adaptation and the degree of adaptation that you, you make in any existing evidence-based intervention, a lot of times we say, well, you know, the intensity of the evaluation has to match how much adaptation you've made, right? So if you have an EBI and then you've changed it a little bit, then you might want to just look at what you've changed and does that have an impact? Um, but if you've changed a lot of it, then you really want to have a solid evaluation to see if you're still getting the, the outcomes that, that they, they saw. When you have an intervention that isn't an, an EBI, I would say that you actually have much more flexibility and that evaluation becomes really, really critical. Wonderful. So next question is from Roxanne who asks um, about documentation. Basically, what is the, the best way or a systematic way to document the adaptations that you're making? I think that's such an important question, Roxanne, because often what happens is there's people want to make many adaptations. You don't know. And if you go back, you're like, OK, what adaptations did I make? What didn't I make? Why did I make it? Um, we tend to use what we call adaptation worksheets to facilitate that process. And um, 
it helps because a lot of times people, you know, they're like, let's adapt everything. And you forget what you actually wanted to do and adapt and sort of why you want to adapt it. So um, we tend to use worksheets. Wonderful. Yeah, with, Go ahead. With I am adapt, with I am adapt, we've tended to use it prospectively um, uh, more than retrospectively, but it certainly can be used that way. Um, one framework that's been used a lot specifically for coding adaptations is the frame. Um, framework and by uh, Shannon Sturman and, and, and her co and colleagues. And I think that that one has, um, there, there's a lot of flexibility and it can be really useful in when you're documenting. Thank you. I could send a link. Wonderful. And that is actually a, picks up right on something I was about to say, which is for all of our audience, I'll note that our speakers have been adding um, particular pieces of information or links to things in the in the chat. So I would encourage folks to go look there. We will have, because this is being recorded, we will have a recording of all the public chat as well and can then create a list of those resources that can be made available. Um, and with that, Sherry, I, let me yeah, ask you I, as the moderator of the session, would I hand it back to you if you have any final questions? Yeah, I do. So um, thanks, Wayne. I was wondering um, one thing that a uh, I, you know, some people spoke about during their talks were sort of tension points. And, um, you know, for example, thinking about your work, Gina, you, you brought your intervention into the Black church and you had to sort of include things like abstinence, but then there's sort of the HIV prevention values of safer sex versus abstinence. And I'm wondering, you know, Laura, you talked about policy barriers. I'm sort of wondering how you get over these tension points when you're, when you're adapting an intervention that started somewhere else with sort of potentially different values. It's a great question, Sherry. It's not like I could walk into the churches with condoms, right? So um, it's communication, you know, and I think this is what, uh, it's in the weeds of adaptation a little bit, right? It's like, okay, so here's the original Abbey. What would you like to adapt? Which would you like to include? So, um, you know, we couldn't bring condoms into the church. Um, we talked about, you know, can we mail condoms to the participants after the intervention? They're like, you can do all that stuff, Gina. But as long as you don't, so you have to sort of be a little bit creative as well. I think adaptation, you know, reflection, I think the prior speakers also mentioned reflection, creativity, it's part science, part creativity, which is, I think, is some of the excitement of it, but it requires, um, just requires reflection. Not sure. If and I, I think, I think um, Laura made some really great comments too about, um, you know about equity and and what it means and how do we pay attention to it and and how do we how do we really approach this work like all of the work we do with with you know cultural humility and um and I, and I think that's really important in adaptation and I also think that you know as public health practitioners you're, you know we're we're really concerned about resources and and um and it just seems like oh, such a waste that these this group wants to develop their own thing when there's this existing intervention that already works. And if we could just get them to buy into it and adapt it. And I think, I think we have to be careful there. I, I think that it, it is an exchange, like Gina said, it's, it's a lot of communication. And, um, and, and, and I think that we have to, you ha we have to really have some self-reflection about when is it, you know, providing information and, and making sure that people are aware of, of what's there and what's possible. Because I think that sometimes um, people might not really realize, oh, what, you know, how can we make this our own, right? What's possible in terms of, of adaptation to actually make this our own thing and really own it um, while still benefiting from the, the possibility that we don't have to do everything. And I think that that dialogue, um, it can be really useful to get past some of those pressure points that you, that you mentioned. Yeah, I think the dialogue, I mean, I, I agree with both, both of you, the dialogue and communication and kind of building those relationships is so important. And really to understand the source of the difference in values. I mean, you know, values, that's a big word and, um, and understanding the trade-offs. Um, so, you know, if we're not going, if we're going to talk about abstinence and not really be upfront about condoms, you know, condom use, 
here's the trade-off of doing that. And, you know, just understanding and being, you know, forthright, I guess, and reflective about those trade-offs. Yeah. Well, so many good questions have come up. We need to move on to the second panel. Um, thank you so much. Um, that first panel was absolutely astounding. I can't wait to dive into some of the materials you've been sharing. Um, and I hope you can stick around if you can um, for more questions at the end. So we're just